From a professional soccer career to becoming a driving force in the mortgage industry, Brian Covey has shown what it takes to find your competitive edge, get off the sidelines, and get in the game. Find your competitive edge with Brian Covey. Okay, guys, welcome back to another edition of Finding Your Competitive Edge. So I am super excited today because I have a guest that's been introduced to me by one of our previous guests, Pastor Nicole. You guys right remember when she was on. And what I love about these introductions is for all of us, we've got to be thinking about through our daily lives, who's that one person that maybe we could be introduced to and that not only maybe we could change their life, they could change our life, we can learn and we can grow. And so today we have Chris and I will tell you about Chris Felton, not only as a speaker, you guys, we've had a lot of speakers on here, but a best-selling Amazon best-selling author that I started to go through his book, you guys are going to want to make sure that you take notes because Chris has obviously been through breakthroughs, but they started with breakdowns. They started with things that didn't go his way, which look in life, we can all relate to that as we go through it. So I want to talk about his book, Think and Grow You, and we're going to work through leadership principles as well. For some of you, if you listen to what Chris talks about in his workshops and what he's taught from stages, he is someone that knows his craft very well. And I was excited about studying for this one and getting prepped because these are the ones that we get to learn and we get to grow together. So make sure you buckle up today. We're going to dive through all of that and more. So Chris, welcome to the show. Brian, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Dude, I love these, man. And, and I was going through your story and what I love is, you know, we're both financial services. You, you've been in it um, a couple of years longer than I started in 2001. You founded your own company there. You're on the speaking circuit. You got an Amazon best-selling book. Uh, we both work with brand builders. We were talking about that before we went live. And there's a lot in common. And I think for, for people today, you know, where I'd love to start is just kind of go back through where that started for you. And I you know for my own journey, I fell into mortgage, financial services, real estate. What was really that journey for you to get started into that? Well, I, uh, I call myself a fully recovered CPA, right? So it's a tw twelve-step program, right? <laughs> De yeah. de not Denial is the first step. Anyway, no, I, um, I I went to Colorado State University, grew up in Colorado, and then uh, came out of college and I went to work for uh, Arthur Anderson, which is a huge accounting firm, and uh, just worked, you know, nonstop, eighty, ninety hours a week for seven years, and then. Yeah, looked to the guy that was 10 years ahead of me who was on his fourth marriage and making a ton of money and his kids hated him and I, I was on that path. And so I, uh, I, I got invited to financial services for lots of reasons, but I wanted to help people learn how money worked because I was a CPA and I was financially literate, which is crazy. And yeah. you, you know the numbers, Brian, 96% right. of Americans retire broke. And so... So I just I got excited about that and then and then you know kind of did it moonlighted on the side you know because 80 90 hours a week wasn't enough doing that I was doing this five to ten hours a week and then bolted full time in February of 2000 after making eight thousand dollars my first year which you know was phenomenal sign of success I spent the first year talking people out of doing business with me so I was really good at that oh man I, I love that isn't it interesting I was talking to somebody the other day about very similarly, my wife and I, we were trying to buy our first house and, you know, I graduated and I had this degree, didn't really know what to do with it. Couldn't get hired anywhere because I didn't have any experience that was relevant. Right. And I'm like, well, we're buying a house and I need help with that. So I'm going to go learn that because I don't know how I, I don't understand it. So at least I can go learn it and help some friends. And I love how you started solving problems at an early age in the CPA piece. And I can see how that layers in for you. And I look at some of your story too. And I love that you talked about this and for a lot of our guests and people that listen, you know, I love that we, we probably have similar paths of, you talk about all these things of being stuck, right? And something you referenced a couple of times and I could relate to it right away. What, what does it mean to be stuck? Like, and let's talk about what that has looked like in your own life. Yeah. I mean, being stuck basically is, uh, it's, it's just resisting what is and what creates stuck is what is happening should not be happening. And one of the things uh, as us as humans need to do is we need to make sure that we stop deluding ourselves. And, and my, my turning point, if you want me to go there, Brian was, uh, you know, really, I, uh, got in a divorce, 
Um, my kids were three, three years old. They're one, three years old, one month old. Their mom picked up, went from Denver, ended up ultimately in Marietta, Georgia. And uh, my second current and last wife, if she's listening, uh, Marlo, <laughs> walked into a financial crap show. I mean, it was, uh, I was really good. I don't know if you've ever been really good at fooling people, <laughs> but I could, I could, uh, talk success. I could give pretty talks about it. I read books and, you know, I look successful, had lots of trophies, yeah. but she walked into a $250,000 of credit card debt. She walked into uh, a lease, a 6,000 square foot lease that I signed. And it's the middle of gr the great recession. And she didn't realize any of this. And, uh, and the best financial decision I ever made was I gave up control of our household and business finances to her um, based on a nudge. And I paid attention to it, which uh, I didn't understand intuition that much then. And so the bottoming out, Brian, was, uh, you know, it was really bad. And I had to pay my ex-wife $5,200 at the beginning of every month in alimony and child support. So I have all this debt. I have a lease. I'm paying her um, negative cash flow, financial services entrepreneur in the Great Recession. And so basically, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation when you're like, how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. This is happening. But I'm in, I'm in the kitchen of our rented home with Marlo. And I'm like, uh, I got a problem. She's like, yeah. I'm like, we, we have to pay the ex tomorrow. And she had a separate side of cash that she kept separate because she was smart enough not to commingle money with a broke dude. And, uh, and she had her eye on a nice Nordstrom suit, Brian, oh. for that money. And I had to go into the kitchen and negotiate with my wife and convince her to give me that money to pay my ex-wife. Wow. I has that ever happened in the history of mankind? Um, not good. And she's five foot one. Everyone in my office is scared of her. And uh, Hurricane Hurricane Marlo started, and I, I turned my head for a second, and her purse comes flying over my head. <laughs> a, 20, a twenty pound purse, right? We could do a show on why women's purses are so big, but. Yeah. Dude, it flew, it scattered all over the ground, stuff went everywhere, and she picked it up, she threw it again, she picked it up, threw it again, picked it up and threw it again. And she just started counting on her fingers, yelling at me, cussing, you, you, you. And I'm like, well, if it's so bad, why are we still together? And then total silence. And she went upstairs the rest of the night to figure that out. And then there I was, and it was my awakening. And all I could see, Brian, in my life was dominoes. And I saw my ex-wife and it hit me at that point that she never really had a chance. I was going to sabotage it because um, one of my favorite things I teach is we don't get what we hope for. We get what we expect. And I realized I expected that thing to fail. Um, my kids, you know, where's dad's beginning, becoming whose dad. I hadn't seen him in months. The financial stress. I'm drinking too much. I'm a disaster, and I just realized that I had to change and uh, get out of hopium. And that's where the masses live. They hope things get better and fiercely insist on remaining the same. Let's dive into that some more because I've heard this before, and I think a lot of people out there, they may think, okay, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm wishing, I'm dreaming about this better life, this better job, this better house, car, or whatever it is better relationship. Maybe they, they dream that I, I'm in better shape, whatever it might be for them. And, and I feel like they get stuck almost in this tunnel of they're hoping and wishing, but their actions never align up for it. So I'd love for you to unpack that a little bit of, you know, what we expect, right? And, and is that something for you? How different is that than people that are hoping for it versus what we expect? Let's break that down for people. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just think the, you know, a lot, a lot of things I cover in my book is just, it, it, it's really about understanding that, you know, there's me plus a thought equals a result, mm -hmm. and the number one skill of world class thinkers, of high performers, is to be in what's called objective reality, 
it's the number one skill. And it's the capacity to look at your results and own your results without beating yourself up. And that's what that's what middle class and the masses do, Brian, is they don't like their results. This was me, right? Yeah. It was it was I don't want to look at my results, so I don't want to look at it. But if I don't own it, then it gets worse. Sure. And optimism and delusion sleep in the same bed together. And so I, I was very optimistic during that period of time. Everyone's like, how's it going? Like, oh, it's, it's awesome. You know, it's just it's great. It's good. It's better than ever. It's unbelievable. And. I was delusional and I didn't want to own my results. And so, so the reason people never really connect with the thinking that's creating the result, that's, that's the first step. Me plus a thought equals a result. I was broke. Then there was me. I'm a financial advisor. I'm a CPA and I'm broke. What's the, what's the thinking that's creating broke. Sure. And so in, in, in the question the the, I call it the kind of the focusing question is what am I focused on and what is that creating? And in my heart of hearts, what am I really expecting to happen? Dude, that's such a powerful question. I ask my agents all the time. I'm like, you're expect, you are getting exactly what you're expecting. You should not be surprised. Yeah. You know, do you think that starts? I love that objective reality that you talk about that because in some ways I think about, you know, emotional intelligence and people that actually have a grasp of where they are today, right? How many people, you said delusional, right? We all have those friends or people we've encountered and, and we know they're completely delusional, not in a good way, but that they are not where they think they are. And that gap is got now, in my opinion, it's gotten so wide because they're not even aware of where their starting point is. And then I love what you said about expectations. And I think about you know, starting with the end in mind, right? And, and I'm here, but I want to be here in certain areas of my life. Then I need to recognize what the actions are in between that. And so I loved how you, you broke that down for people. When you were going through this and you're writing the book and, and, and I love that you broke that down. Are there specific actions when you're in that moment that you start to go, okay, now I'm being objective. I'm, I'm clear on actually where I am truthfully. And then this is the reality and I want to move forward. Are there steps or a process that people can go, okay, I got that now, Chris, like I can move forward now that I have my starting point and clarity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a couple things. One was uh, I was getting comfortable in my uncomfortable life. Right. And, and I start my book with uh, my favorite quote from Jeff Shore is, you know, the masses are addicted to comfort, yeah. Brian. And my favorite quote is a life spent seeking comfort results in an entirely uncomfortable existence. Yeah. It's powerful. And so I was getting, I was getting comfortable with dysfunction and broke. And so the first thing I had to do was I had to really collect the emotional juice to move. And what I did is I asked myself, who's paying a price for me staying this way? Mm -hmm. It was powerful. Because the the physical the, the 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 financial stress physically impacting my my wife, my kids. I mean, all this stuff, man. Like, it's just I'm like, dude, it's too heavy. Yeah. And 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 so it was, it was, you know. And, and the next day, uh, you know, Marla and I came together, and to her immense credit, we have nothing without her. In her time of stress, Brian, she focused on what was good in me. And she interrupted my self-sabotaging relationship pattern, which is, you know, I'd hit some adversity. It caused some stress in our relationship. I'd start focusing on the negative in them. And then I'd be like, oh, there's some, you know, utopian uh, unicorn sunshine lollipops and roses relationship out there that requires no work. And it's just easy and all that. And so because my wife focused on what was good in me, caused me to focus on what was good in her. And we sat down and she said, we're not, we're not getting divorced. We're not declaring bankruptcy. We're not getting jobs. Uh, we had access to wealthy mentors. She's like, I'm going to interview these people and I'm going to figure out what they do and how they think our first book couples money came from this. Um, and then she was kind of like, what are you going to do? Chris Felton. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm going to figure out how this creates this 
and I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer your question here, but, but it was, it was really the decision and most people are interested in a great life. They're not committed. Yeah, right. And the most ridiculous thing that's happened in society is the belief through social media that you can get something for nothing. Yeah. You can't. And I said, and when you're interested, you'll hit roadblocks and you'll have what I call chicken exits. You'll go to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, taking your old butt into the new thing. And I said, I'm committed. And she's like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, you know how an Olympic athlete treats their sport? No question. They're all in. She's like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, I'm committed. What are you going to do? I'm like, I'm up early, 4, 4.30, 5 a.m. I'm not saying people need to get this obsessed, but, dude, I got obsessed Yeah. because my back was against the wall. And she's like, what are you going to do that time? I'm, I'm like, I'm going to figure out my belief systems around money, and I'm going to figure out why – my belief systems keep doing this. I'm going to read, read my Bible, pray, journal, visualize image. You told me to stand on my head for an hour is going to change my life. I was going to do it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so, so we can talk about the next steps, but, but the first one to me was total 100% all in commitment to changing because I was sick of it. And too many people were paying a huge price for me staying stuck. I love how you go through that too, because that is real life. Like I can relate to that. And I'm sure people listening are going, yeah, that's me. And, and I do think very similar in the 07, 08, we had our first two kids, financial collapse, right? Everything is just never seen this before in my life. I'm still new um, in, in the world of business and seeing everything collapse as you know it and two kids and looking at my wife and trying to figure out how are we getting out of this? Like my job's eliminated, all the stuff you're going through. And I remember in that moment, something very similar of I'm showing up for the, my wife and my two kids. Like if nothing else, like all the pity party we have for ourselves and all that stuff is like, dude, we, we don't have time for this. And I love what you said too, because as an athlete, there were seasons and points at which look at any great athlete. And I know in my journey, you had to get obsessed about something, whether it's working on something that you need to improve on, whether it's your fitness, whether it's your mindset, you had to get to a level of obsession or you didn't create a breakthrough. Not, not at that level, especially like D1 and professional athletes. You watch them, Olympic athletes, they get so obsessed about their craft. And so I love that you say that because too many times people are just interested. Like, yeah, you know, Chris, like I want to I, I wanna do better in my finances, make more money and all that. It's like, you sound interested. Like committed people, I love that you put actions behind it. And even it's so, it's so intentional. I'm going to wake up earlier. I'm going to start to read books. I'm going to start to walk a little bit, right? I'm going to start to learn about how money works and you put actions behind it. I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit more because I think this is where people really, they, they stay in the interested camp longer than they want. Some really want to move forward and they're like, well, what do I do next? Like now that I know my, my real why behind who I'm showing up for, I got kind of an idea of where I want to go. Like, where do I start to get from where I am? To start, I always say like getting back in the game and you, you, you shared this uh, in your book, how to get out of your own way. I think a lot of us are in our own way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's the pillar. I mean, the, the, the pillars, I mean, the problem the book solves is stuck and the pillars are first is you got to get out of your own way. And that is, these are the self-sabotaging tendencies that lead to a result I don't like. Uh, the next is I got to, I got to shift. So how do you shift? which is what I learned. And then, you know, the relationships is one pillar, um, the game plan, the how to's, right. Because a lot of people are like, well, once I fix myself, Brian, and they become, you know, personal development zombies, you know, and they're just like taking an info and not applying, which is my superpower is taking something and applying it. Love that. Um, but, but, but really um, the, the last pillar is it's, it's really the dream and the clarity and this topic in personal development is probably the most beat up topic on the planet is what do you want? You got to know your why. And, and, you know, Brian, I'd, I'd sit through all these great trainings. I've, I've been blessed to have incredible mentors and they'd be like, you got to be clear on what you want and you got to do the why and all this. And I'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I take notes. And then, you know, I'd walk out of a convention center and then a, then a squirrel would run by. And I'd be like, oh, squirrel. Awesome. I'm going to let me, I'm going to go track down that squirrel. And then once I get that squirrel, or as my mentor calls it, Felton, quit chasing wild asparagus. 
Uh, and um, and uh, and it is. It is sitting your butt down and going, what do I really, 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 really want? That's the first step. Mm. And my mentors all have always checked me on that. They're like, what do you want? What are you aiming for? What's the goal? What's the thing? What's this? And if I hemmed, hawed, stuttered, they're like, you're not clear. What is it? I'm like, and then finally, my wife and I sat down. We were totally broke, brother. And I'm like, what do you want? She's like, we got to get 100000 saved. And my, my left brain CPA is like, oh, okay, goody. I'm going to spreadsheet this thing out and yeah. bring all my left brain strategy and you know all that stuff. And my mentors are like, dude, you got it. Hey, you got a Ferrari in your entrepreneurial vehicle. And you better put some gas in that tank. And so we sat there for an hour, Brian. I'm like, why do you care? Why does this matter? What's going to move me? And, and I'm like, I'm sick of you being stressed around money. I'm sick of not being an example. I'm sick of not seeing my kids. Tying it back to people. I got to prove I can do this. Um, and we spent all this time on the gas and the juice, and we filled up our vehicle. But really, that, that was the first step. And it's the single greatest goal we've ever set as a couple. And we were just obsessed, obsessed about it. And and we talked about it. And we had a meeting point every week. And where are we? And I'm like, God, we got five bucks closer. And we celebrated the wins. And anyway, it was uh, it was amazing. But it was the first time in my life where I was like really, really, really super clear. And most people aren't clear. So how do you get clear as you're hearing this? Grab your phone. I call it the weapon of mass distraction and go to your, go to your calendar, book a time, go someplace that's nice, grab a journal and a pen. Don't put it on a laptop and sit there and ask yourself what I really want my life to look like and spend the time doing the hardest work on the planet, which is thinking. And most people avoid it. And you know, Chris, I love how you talk about that because that has been the breakthroughs in my own life was truly just the journaling of what, what is it? And especially my wife and I, like, you know, what is it that we want and why do we want it? Right. And looking at that and, and that resonates with me is more time with my kids as they're getting older has become more and more and more important because I realize you don't ever get that back. And seeing friends with older kids actually just reaffirms that to go, man, that's what they all say. None of them have told me, I wish I made more money or I wish I had worked harder. Or, I wish I'd gotten that promotion. They're like, I wish I'd spent more time here. And I'm like, cool. That, that's a driver to make more money to then have the choices to say, yeah, I'm not going to go do that. I get to go do this. And when you talked about saving that $100,000, I'm curious there because I actually had a mentor tell me this. It was about seven years ago, very similarly. And we've been doing well. Things were good and all that. We hit some bumps in the road and some of that. And I remember when a mentor said, you know, do, do you have 100000 saved up? And I'm like, 100000 What? And that was the starting point of you know, we need to relook at this, right? And so I'd learned lessons before, but I hadn't learned the next level of lessons. And I found through that journey, and I'd love your experience of how you felt when you first were like writing that 100,000 down. And then at each point, it feels like there's always a next level. Once sure. we've gained the information, we've taken action, we realize, wow, the information plus action creates results. Yeah, I mean that 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 was the goal, and it felt like Mount Everest, right? And um, yeah, it did. And, and and so you know, part of my part of my morning routine was, you know, kind of visualizing what that would mean and felt like, and it just it just kept it felt like it was just too far off, and it was unbelievable to me. And and also, you know, my tendency to go left brain on stuff. So I'm like, okay, did my visualization? Check, you know, check, check, check. And nothing was moving, right? Because as you know, Brian, your capacity to influence your subconscious mind will be the biggest determining factor of your success. That's why obsessions, there's good obsessions and bad obsessions. And getting financially independent, it's a great obsession um, because of what it can mean uh, for people. But, but anyway, so we set the goal. And I'm like, it's just, it's not clicking. And then I got a, a great tip from something. It was like, identify the feeling you want to have before you start the imaging and visualization session. And I said, what do we want, honey? She's like, we want relief. 
I get goosebumps every time I say that. She's like, we want relief. And I'm like, got it. And, and so what I had to do is I had to kind of bring it down a little bit. And my imaging was, you know, that first 10 grand, that's going to feel pretty good too. Yeah. And the momentum and the snowball effect of that going down the hill is huge. So I, I would just image, Brian, my wife coming down the stairs of our rented home. And we still have this $250,000 of debt hanging out here, right? But our mm -hmm. mentor said, if you can't save money, you'll never be debt free. And, and the law of growth, what we focus on expands me focusing on debt, not that we put our head in the sand on it, but me focusing on debt, just kept creating, kept creating more debt. So he said, are you focusing on debt, fixing problems? Or are you focused on creating wealth? I was like, Ooh, creating wealth. Yeah. So that first 10 grand and then the relief. And so the image was her coming down the stairs, uh, on a Wednesday in her ski outfit. And her kissing me on the forehead and going skiing for the day because she felt safe enough to go take the day off. And if I did that right, Brian, I would just wake up from that in tears mm. because that feeling and then the subconscious um, and it works. Right. And that that changed my whole relationship with money. You couldn't get me to spend a dollar that was going to take us further away. And so fast forward, I, I can't remember the timing, but we'd gotten a huge payday and and we had saved, you know, a bunch of money and we were moving and that, you know, that feeling, that dopamine hit of like, I'm on the right path. You're not necessarily there yet, but you just know it. And so we got this big paycheck and she's like, we could save all of it. And I was, uh, we were sleeping. And it was three in the morning and I woke up in the middle of the night and I went, oh. and for years, Brian, that was oh. fear, doubt, dread, all that. But it was like, oh my God, that's relief. That's what it that's is. The feeling, one of the greatest feelings of my life. So the stuff works if you do it. Well, and I love that you, you actually pick the words so intentionally, right? And the relief and I could even hear it and feel it as you were sharing that is like, and, and I can relate to that too. Cause that relief, when you have not had that cushion or that feeling and then to have it. And also, you know, as I was listening to you too, and, and for people out there, guys, when you hear what Chris is going through and you hear the momentum that's gained, you might hear about the big Mo, you know, John Maxwell talks about this, but when you create momentum and you get to the 10, then you get to 25 and 50 and it's like, it just starts to feel good. And that's who you become like, this is who we are. And things start to not get easier, but they start just to feel like, yep, that's just what we do. That's how we go. So I'd love for you to talk about this because this is where I see a lot of people stall as well, right? You have this goal, you're gonna get to 100,000, you're gonna pay off the 250, you got the debt out there, you're doing all these things, making more money, you're feeling good. How do you continue to push forward and not get stuck at that next level? Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's a chapter in my book, it's called Don't Settle. Yep. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a big one. And I've, I've been blessed to be in a company where I've just, I've been around just phenomenal entrepreneurs that just crushed it. And then they didn't. And, you know, it's uh, we're only going to find true fulfillment in growing and contribution to others. Yeah. End of story. And if you think you're going to find it in stuff and the boats and the homes and the car, I mean, we just, my wife and I just recently massively downsized because I'm like, I mean, this is like, this is stuff. Like, you know, and it's easy to get trapped in that. And it's just like, I call it looking for love in all the wrong places, man. Like it's just, but I just, I, I just watch it, Brian. I just watch mentors just be on fire. They're on, they're, they're, they're climbing the mountain. They get to the top and then they fall this little egoic trap. That's like, Oh, you deserve it. You just need to chill and call. And they pull back and dude, they're miserable. And they don't know why. And I say this to them every time. I'm like, because you stop growing, dude. Yeah. And you're not contributing to others. And you're not going to find it in the next trip or next app. Now, do you have fun along the way? Yeah. The masses think it's either or. No. The world class knows it's both. You can 
rock it, have fun, do both. So the, the hard work is really staying clear constantly. And we hit those goals. We knocked them out of the park. And dude, you're happiest on the path towards the goal. Yeah. You know, the analogy I give, it's like, it's like the, you know, the afternoon after Christmas morning, right? All the energy with your kids going up till Christmas morning is unbelievable. Christmas comes, they get their, right? And then the energy drops off. Yeah. And so you are happiest when you're going after something. And the only time you have real enthusiasm is when you take joy and you combine it with a goal. Mm. That's when you're in your most juice is when you're going after something. So it's cool to chill. It's cool to party. It's cool to, you know, have fun and, and, and reward yourself. But you just, you got to tee it back up and sit down and say, okay, cool. What do I really, really, really want next and do the work and, and go after it. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, I resonate with that. I think a lot of people will hear that and go, okay, that, that's where I am. I'm feeling stuck. I've had some success, but I am feeling stuff because they're not growing. Or to your point, secondarily, they're not contributing to others. And so they, they feel like that, that fulfillment is, is evading them in a way. And, and that is so true. I've gone back in my own life and looked and said, am I growing? Like, let's be real. Let's do that self-assessment again. And how am I contributing to others in the world? And you're right. When you're serving other people, all of a sudden, man, like you're expanding and you're going through that. So I love that chapter on don't settle because I've seen that as well. The top salespeople, especially in financial services, they get to a certain level and they're like, nobody in their family's ever gotten there. They probably never thought they'd actually get there. They get there and it's like, cool, man, we're just going to sit back. And, and I really don't think that's what God's called us to do. You know, not at all. Not at all. Right. And you think about what he's allowed you to get through to get to this point to stop there would one be extremely selfish, but two, it's not even close to your potential that, that God has gifted you with experiences in these gifts to give people. And so I'd love for you to talk about that and your faith and how, you know, now you're one of those guys I look at and go, man, it's, it's a kind of a lighthouse in a way of, yes, you've got the financial services and your company you founded there, but you've written a book and you're speaking and you're doing these workshops and all of these things. What does that look like and what role has faith played in allowing you to become more of an expansive leader? I would say. Out yeah. There more? yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I was a spiritual mess. I mean, I, uh, I, I mean, I got a chapter in the book called get spiritual and um, you know, and I was kind of taking this kind of new age path of, of things um, which actually opened me up. And uh, but yeah, I mean, God was hunting me down. That's for sure. And uh, um, but it was uh it was the the quote uh, that I use in the book from Billy Graham is once somebody gets their attitude straight around money, it helps straighten out every area of their life. Yeah. And, uh, and that was really, uh, I mean, it sounds weird, but my, my focus on getting stable financially uh, really opened me up spiritually. Mm -hmm. And because there's all these things I had to let go of. Um, one of them was I had to forgive my ex-wife. You know, because my coach is like, uh, you're going to be broke if you don't forgive your ex-wife. I'm like, what? Yeah. That was his first assignment he gave me, Brian. Wow. He's like, you got to forgive your ex-wife. I was like, no, man, there's there's got to be some strategy here. No, man, it's a how-to thing. He's like, no. He's like, it's not it's not time management. It's energy management. And, and you got a massive energy leak there. And so he said, if you don't, forgive your ex-wife, I'm firing you and I'm going to keep your money. Hmm. It's not an option. This was our first coaching session, Brian. Wow. And I'm like, and, I, and so then I would fight him a little bit on things. And then he always had this question. You can use this one. It's beautiful. My guys hate it. Based on results, how's your way working? <laughs> Pierces right. right through. Oh, he's like, How's your way working? Let's, let's review your results, buddy. Uh, your, your second wife's got a foot out the door. You're broke. You're drunk. You're a mess. How's your way working? Mm. It's not. All right. Okay, coach. How do I forgive her? He's like, when we're done, I want you to grab a pad of paper. I want you to write her name at the top. And I want you to write down everything you appreciate about her. 
And I want you to do this exercise every single day until you no longer need to. And you will know. And I was like, so Brian, I grabbed it. And I just, I, just, I like held onto this pad of paper like this. And I mean, the resentment was, I couldn't, nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, man, he's so right. And then finally I was like, she's a great mom. Um, and then I, the next day I found one more thing the next day I found one more thing next day. I'm like, maybe she's my greatest teacher. Um, this, 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 and then about three weeks into it, I'm, I'm asking, I'm, I'm answering your spirituality question with this. Cause I love it. This, this, this was huge. Um, and then, you know, literally, and you know how the brain works, man, like the new neural pathways start firing. My perception of her totally changes, right? And then it's like, yeah. okay, so we never had the big forgiveness conversation. Her and I never had that. She's in Atlanta, I'm in Colorado, right? But then I was texting her, hey, you know, uh, Merry Christmas, you know, Happy Mother's Day. Thanks for what you do uh, for, our, for my kids and all this. And then, you know, my kids were big baseball players in uh, Georgia. And... I would come down to the game and then, you know, it was just things shifted. I mean, we were never like buddy, buddy. Right. But like we were, we were business partners and we were respectful business partners. And I would sit there and I'd be watching the game with her. And then this, this divorced husband going through a divorce would come up to me and he's like, how do you do that? I'm like, do what? He's like, how do you stand there? I'm like, well, I got this exercise for you. And everyone looks at me like I'm an alien. Right. Um, but you know it dude it's unbelievable and literally i mean you're in nashville a month ago it's my oldest his graduation vanderbilt like it's the last chapter in my book i don't know if you've gotten the last chapter in my book but it's an unbelievable story of when my my oldest got into vanderbilt and i was there and giving her a big hug and I said, good for you. And she said, nope, good for us. Wow. And three weeks ago, I'm sitting there, man. It's like, God, that, oh. that, story, that story always gets me, brother. Like, like, this is, no, I just like, it was, I'm like, gosh, dang it. All this work. It's, it's the last part of my book, man. I want to drive home to people. It's worth it. Yes. Right. It's worth it. People get so jacked up on, is it going to be worth it? What if I do this? You know, and in that moment, it wasn't about the savings. It wasn't about the money. It was just about her and I healing and my kid. I mean, I hit the jackpot. I hit the dad jackpot with my kids. Yeah. You know, and uh, I got stories in there about her, her, her husband and resolving all that. And so where is spirituality playing all this? Everywhere, mm. everywhere, man. I mean, it was just, I was a freaking mess. I was a disaster. And, uh, you know, God didn't, God didn't let go of that. And I, I, I'm thankful every single day that, man, I mean, I was, dude, I was teetering. I was going in a very, very, very bad place. And if it wouldn't have been for my spirituality and my focus on my spiritual development, I, I think, not think, I know that's the thing I'm probably the most, proud of is just that development and that's why it's why it's a chapter in the book it was actually the hardest chapter to write because i just I, I just couldn't i didn't know how to get it out but um but that last chapter of just her and i having that moment and then yeah my, my oldest graduated from vanderbilt a month ago and they have a party on the big on this infield and it's just it's everybody and they pour champagne for like four hours and it's just I'm sitting there with her and my former ex mother in law with my kids, and I'm just like, unbelievable, man. man. It's it's freaking worth it. Dude, thank you for sharing that. I think that's going to help a lot of people. Is they're probably thinking somebody in their life they need to forgive, you know? And yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and and sorry, man. But it's just such an important topic. I, I also know that's that's the reason why God put that book on my heart mm -hmm. is because of this. Because having seen the results of forgiving her, I made a, a promise every time I did a keynote, I was going to end with that. 
and I'll come off the stage and I'm like, God, you know, I nailed that and give feeling all good about myself. And there's people waiting for you. And they're always like, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me I'm stuck because I need to forgive X, Y, Z. And I was in Texas. This was a year ago. I came off stage. This guy came up to me and it was a four hour half day workshop. Mm. And he's like, Okay, that was all good, but that he's like that last thing. You're telling me I need to forgive my ex-wife. I'm like, how long has it been, brother? Thirty years. Wow. And he's kind of resisting it. And then I said, Hey, based on his I know based on results, yada yada yada. And he said, Wait here. And I talked to a few more people. He went out in the parking lot. He came back 30 minutes later, dude. His eyes were puffy. He was just he had snot in his beard. <laughs> like yeah. he looked 10 years younger, bro. He looked 10 <sighs> years younger. And I'm like, what did you do? He's like, I called her. And I told her how much I appreciated her. And I loved her. And I forgave her. And he kissed me on the cheek, walked out the door, and never saw him again. And uh it's it's freaking powerful. Mm. And, People stink at it, and I know that's why I'm meant to get this message out to tens of millions of people. I love it, and we're, we're definitely going to share that out. And I think about, um, I know you were on Ed's show and have been with, um, he's been a great mentor to me, and I think about when he shares, and people shared it before, but I've heard Ed share it the best of, you know, God doesn't um, call the qualified, you know, he qualifies the called, and, and you stepped into that. And for many people listening to this, Man, just stepping into the fight, stepping into the battle and doing what's required, and it's not easy. But if, if you want a great life and you want to enjoy your time that you have here, and, and it's all limited for all of us, you have to step into the battle. It's, it's not being interested anymore. It's moving to committed. And I love this, this kind of final question um, for you, Chris. I've listened and I have a perspective, but um, what, what do you think your competitive edge is? Um, it's, it's, it's persistence. I mean, it's just, I'm, I, I just persist. I mean, when, when I'm clear on the benefits to others, I'm pretty relentless, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and, and putting out a book and doing all this stuff. And I've done, I don't know, 70 or so of these shows in the last 30 days. And it's just, you know, I'm, I'm really clear on the mission. I'm clear on the benefit and I'm clear on the impact. And so, um, I just, I don't, I don't shrink back. I'm clear. It, it, if it's all about me, it's usually not going to get it done and I, I don't have the energy and the juice to do it, but, um, I just, I get clear on how, and, and you know, that's a big thing. And like one of the things we have to always do is we got to, sell ourselves on the value that we create. And uh, that's why we got to work on increasing our value and we got to sell ourselves on the value, but we always got to focus on the impact we're going to make for other people. And then you just, you got to be relentless. Yeah. You got to be relentless with it. And, uh, and you can do that in a very positive, joyful way, right? You don't need to be an a-hole. You don't need to be rough and tough. Um, but uh, yeah, I think persistence and being relentless when I'm clear on how it's going to make an impact for others is, is one of my keys. I love it, man. And I would, I would echo that and actually add as I was listening and, and kind of preparing is you have this really cool blend of the toughness and that relentless and almost tenacity of, okay, here's what I need to go do and I'm going to implement it. I'm going to be able to execute the idea into action. And then you combine that with the vulnerability of what you shared and even in that last chapter, those two together, I, I think, as I listen, I think that's really an expansive version of what your competitive edge, because when you bring those together, it's why you're unstoppable. It's, it's why people are showing up to the workshops. It's why they're showing up to hear you speak and hiring you and paying you to do that. And it's why I really think your book, um, I think it's going to continue to touch a lot of lives. And so thank you for stepping into that, because a lot of people shy away from it. And don't step into it and, and you're setting the example for that so thank you for sharing all that today uh, i want to give people a resource where, where can they find you how can they connect up and get more from chris because i, I know they're going to want more 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, man. Pre thanks for having me, brother. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, having me on the show and you never know what you're going to get when you have somebody on. It's always a risk. And I appreciate the, the trust and, and the faith in, in me to, to come on. Um, yeah, uh, Chris Felton dot me. So uh, sort of the, my brand new masterclass. That's a deep dive in the book is uh is there in uh, uh workshops keynote speaking i mean that's that's what uh that's what i'm all about and the book is written in such a way that people literally can say hey i want you to cover these are specific things i want you to cover for my my crew even workshop format keynote format so yeah looking looking to to help people that way love it guys make sure you grab a copy of think and grow you and make sure you follow chris and I always say this, guys, at the end, right? Like we do this to impact lives. This is not something we're out trying to uh, profit or like our main gigs and things. But I think, you know, Chris aligns up with this message of, you know, we're, we're here to make a difference in one person's life. And if that's you today, you heard something that resonated or you heard something, you're like, hey, man, you guys talked about this. I'm stuck here. I need some help. Reach out. I read all those comments. We respond to the DMs, all that stuff. I believe that's why God put us here is... You know, Rory Vaden says this, so I'll plug him from Brand Builders. For and AJ, sure. they talk about you're most uniquely equipped to serve who you once were. And, and Rory says it much better than that. But you think about all these past experiences and things you've been through and all the times you've been stuck and you've made it to where you are today. You can now help those former versions of you. And that's why it's upon us to continue to learn and grow and to make sure, as you shared earlier, and to contribute to the world and, and serve other people. And so make sure... Connect up, let us know that, like the show, leave us a comment, let us know other guests that need to be on, and make sure you show Chris some love because, guys, when we have guests on like this, he's poured a lot into us, and I want to make sure if there's something that stood out or you need help with, let us know. That's why we're here. So, Chris, thank you, my friend. And, Thanks, brother. Uh, I will have to connect up when you're back in Nashville. Hey, Amen, brother. Can't wait. Thank you. Well, guys, this has been another episode of Finding Your Competitive Edge. Hopefully today you have heard something. You said, you know what? That's me. I can now take an action and move forward and leverage your competitive edge in the service of others, and you're going to find true fulfillment. We'll catch you on the next episode. Cheers. Okay.